up this presentation, mainly because, to my own embarrassment, I fell for a couple of scams, and I really did not want it to happen to anybody else. I was fortunate in that it didn't cost me a lot of money or any money, but it has really cost in time and aggravation. Um, I'll tell you about it later. But um, anyway, I'm delighted that people are here, and these scammers are just getting more sophisticated and more plausible all the time and constantly developing new forms. So it's, it's good to get updated information. So we're happy to have today Jennifer Pardini. She is Community Education Coordinator for Legal Assistance for Seniors, which is a um, function of Alameda County. And we also have Sean Casey from the Fraud Prevention Department at Patelco Credit Union. And um, I particularly wanted to invite Patelco because they were the ones that saved my bacon <laughs> the last time around and said, eh, 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 this is a scam, stop. So thank heaven for that. So off we go, Jennifer and Sean. Thank uh, you so much. And just welcome on, the, on behalf of Ashby Village, and we're delighted to see everybody here. Just a quick correction, I actually work in the Information Security Department. Oh. We work very closely with our fraud prevention folks. Um, the people who helped you out is, is a fantastic team. And, and we, we talk a lot because information security and fraud just tie together so closely. So, wanted to be clear on that one. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I was here, um, I believe, in June, too. So, some of this may look familiar. I'm going to try to uh, not spend as much time on things that you may have already seen if you were here, but uh, we'll, we will talk a lot about fraud today. I am from Legal Assistance for Seniors. We have a legal department that provides free legal services. I'm from Community Education, and we have HICAP, which is the Medicare Counseling Program. I'll just briefly go through uh, those things, and then we are a nonprofit, so we do provide free services to older adults in Alameda County. These are the areas of law that our attorneys work in. I'm not gonna go super in depth today, but on the table, there is a yellow paper that goes through all these services and our brochure lists all of them. So I will stick around if you want to ask me about any of our legal services afterwards, I can answer questions. I am not an attorney and I cannot answer your legal question, but I can answer questions about our services. HICAP is the Medicare Counseling Program. The important thing to know is that it is free help with Medicare and we don't sell insurance. So if you have a question about anything related to Medicare or if you ever have a problem with coverage or your insurance, you can come to us for help. This is all like, oh, we get funded from the county and da, da, da. But uh, I'm not gonna go through all of it right now. So just know that we are free if you need anything. Our counselors are excellent. They're very well trained. Now we can talk about fraud. So we always start with white seniors, and we, uh, we were just talking about this a little bit at the back. Uh, across, the studies show across ages, people get scammed at relatively the same rate, but older adults tend to get targeted because people believe that they will have more to pull from, right? More savings or more uh, property they can take out of. Um, also, that they will be willing to talk to someone, right? They think, oh, they'll, they'll be home, or they might be lonely, so they'll talk to me longer on the phone to get deeply into this scam. There are a lot of different scams, and we'll be asking you too about what you know, but some of the basic, uh, or at least the basic principle is that they're gonna try and get your personal information, and they're gonna try and get it by offering you something. Did you wanna? I was just gonna jump in. They're, they're gonna try to get all kinds of things, anything that they can from you. If they get a little bit of information, they can sell that to somebody else who will try to use it in the next scam. Um, if they can get you to give them access to banking or send them some money, uh, they will also take advantage of that. These, this, these, these people have a profession, and that is scamming people. They do it very well, and they have their own little communities where they share this information. So that's why it's important to, to not trust these, these phone calls as they come in. Yeah, like, like the conversation back there. If you've got a text, it's a scam. Right, so just don't, don't trust it. Um, so the ones we know we hear a lot about are like, oh, you've won a free prize, or you've won a vacation. We're just gonna need some information to get you enrolled. Um, 
I'm going to go left, right. Also, the lottery one. Okay, so if if you didn't enter a lottery, you didn't win the lottery. <laughs> Shucks. Yeah. Um, and this one's like, oh, I get so excited. I we have a, a roommate. We rent out a room in our house, and she's in her fifties. Okay, she came home and she's like, Jenny, someone's going to drop thirty thousand dollars off in cash. And I was like, Becky, no, they're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, she's like, no, but like it was, they had contacted her through social media, and she's like, no, but they're asking me like, what am I going to do with it? And I want to go to Universal Studios, and I want to do this. And I was like, it, did you give them any information? <laughs> Please do not give them any information. And she's, I think, I mean, they had her name, and I think maybe she had given them our address. But I was like, that's it, you're done. Do not give them any more information because you're not going to get a double bag full of cash. <laughs> Um, and of course they're asking you what you're going to do with it because that gets you bought in and you're excited and it feels real. Um, and now they're going to ask you for a lot of things. And she did cut off communication with them and she was really sad about it. Um, but I'm, I'm glad she said something because I was like, no, like I do presentate, like I promise they're not coming. Um, and then, do you, do you have, did you want to add any? Okay. Uh, thank you. Door-to-door, uh, -door, I think that because of COVID, the door-to-door -door is becoming less common, at least for a while. People were not knocking on doors because nobody wanted to talk to anybody. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't start back up now that people are feeling that they're moving out of that period. So, you know, if someone knocks on the door, my, my message is you don't owe opening the door to anyone. So even if they're knocking, right? Even if, even if the police, if they do not have a warrant, you do not have to open the door. You do not owe opening the door to anyone. So if someone says they're from PG&E, they might be, oh, we're in the area and we're supposed to be doing this. And they might want to gather some personal information from you. Well, there are some companies that like contract and do like some sort of things, but they're not actually PG&E and you don't have to give them your personal information. Um, if you do think that they're supposed to be in the area, you can call the number on your PG&E bill and ask them, is someone supposed to be coming to my house or in my area, um, before you give out any information. On that same note of you don't owe an open door to anybody, uh, that's also sometimes a pretext for uh, home invasions where they, they come in and rob your mind uh, because they got you to open the door first. Yeah. We're not here to scare you, but... <laughs> Um, then there's the phone, right? So, okay, forget the people at the door. Now we've got the people who are calling. Um, a lot of them, you're going to get these pre-recordings. The most common and popular ones we've heard of are both IRS and Social Security. Both of those agencies don't call you on the phone. They send you letters. Um, so if, if you get that automated recording, I don't care if you get it six times in one day, which happened to my wife, and she's calling me going, Babe, are you sure? I think I have to call them. And I'm like, no, don't call them. It is a scam. Um, they just are going to ask you for information. But it was so persistent, and it was because she had like, picked up or something, so that it keeps targeting her. Uh, and I'm like, no, don't call. And then it's, it's always you know, urgent. The sheriff's going to come out because you owe taxes. And we're going to send the sheriff out if you don't pay your taxes. And then they're probably going to ask you to go get gift cards to pay those taxes. And that should feel suspicious, okay? Anything that's asking you to pay in gift cards is a scam. Because once they get, once you give that information off the back of that gift card, you are not going to see your money again. Thoughts? So, the, very much so. The, the IRS is, is not spending a whole lot of money at Amazon. They, they have a procurement process that they go through. So they, they, they don't need Amazon gift cards. Frosters do. Yeah. Now, what I, what I want to ask about is, Jennifer, did you notice what the caller ID said on the on the messages or the call that they got? It probably said private. I don't remember. Okay. How many people here trust caller ID on your phone? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, so for a lot of us do. A lot of us do. Because if we trust our phone, we, we put everything in our phones. The problem is that my caller ID is, is not trustworthy right now. So if I can, I can go out, I can spend $10 on a website that will take care of the phone calls for me and then I tell it that all of these calls are coming from this phone number and it should have this name on it. And most of the time it works. It's, it's a tangled mess with the, uh, the call uh, company. So your cell phone companies, each one of them handles it a little bit differently. But 
I've had a number of, uh, of our members call in saying, I just got a call from somebody saying they were from Patelco. And, and we look in the records and we say, that wasn't us. And, and then we started enacting our, our fraud prevention protocols and making sure that the, the member is taken care of. But I, I say this to, to discourage you to, uh, from trusting it without verifying uh, the, the calls that are coming into your phones. I will also just touch on the social security one tells you that your number has been compromised and it's going to be suspended. And if you're like, uh, I need to be able to like pay for my expenses next month, that feels pretty urgent. So it might feel like you need to call them, but you don't. Be that recording, it's all a scam. And then I've also multiple times gotten one in Chinese. And I was like, mm, this is not for me. Yeah. You get that too? Yeah, I've gotten a number of times. I actually yeah. got it translated. Yeah, so I asked a friend, I was like, what is this saying? And he said, oh, it says you have papers at the consulate that you need to deal with. And I went, hmm, okay. Uh, so if you know someone that's getting those, if it's someone who legitimately actually speaks and understands the language, they might think that that's true. So please pass on that word, it is a scam. You don't have papers. Uh, and then computer viruses. So if anyone initiates the call to you, and tells you there's something wrong with your computer, you should hang up the phone. Because it's very possible that maybe it is running slowly or maybe there's something going on. But that person didn't know that. They want to remotely get into your computer so that while it looks like they're fixing something and maybe even they're charging you while they pretend they're fixing it, uh, they're actually in the back end looking for all kinds of information. I feel like you probably have more to say about that. So yeah, they, first of all, they didn't get your phone number from your computer because it's probably not there in an easy place to find. Like, tech support, please call me at this number. It's, it's not a file on your desktop. They're calling out, and, and they're trying to get you to divulge a little bit of information. Oh, we well, noticed that your computer's running slow. Have, have any of us ever said, wow, my computer's running really fast today. Like, no, we all complain about the computers being slow. So, so this, is, this is a little bit of kind of a, a manipulation or like a, like a, a carnival psychic trying to get a little bit of information, and then they expand their story from there. Oh, yeah, well, we see that, it, you know, the, the who's he what's it's doing the thing about Bob, and we need you to install this software so that we can come in and fix it for you. Well, you've just given up control of your computer to a stranger, and they're not going to do good things with it. Yeah. If they can find your account information, if they can find your passwords to things, there, there, there's software out there that will actually let them just remote control your your, yeah. your sessions and, and they'll actually go back into your banking session. They'll hide that window so that only they can see it and then they start initiating transfers. Yeah. So if you legitimately have something wrong with your computer, you can get it fixed, but not by someone who called you to tell you that something was wrong. Um, if, you know, if it's an Apple device, you can take it to the Mac store. If it's from a different company ceremony, um, I would call the company that makes my computer to see what the process is for getting things fixed. But, uh, you know, just don't give any information to anyone that calls you. And that's going to be the, like a rule of thumb for all these things we talked about today. Um, I will jump to the other side and kind of tie these two together. At the beginning of COVID, there was a lot of scam stuff happening of, oh, we can get you the vaccine or we can get you a cure. And there's less of that happening now. But if you need any services related to COVID, go through your medical providers. Don't respond to someone that's calling you. And then we were also seeing at the beginning a lot of charity scams of, oh, like so-and-so is affected because of COVID and they can't work in this and donate money. And you're like, oh no, this is terrible and we want to help. So you want to donate money. Um, some of that may still be tied to health things, but there are plenty of other groups that are claiming to be charities that are not real. Um, on the resources over there, there's one that has a bunch of phone numbers you can call for different things, and the website for Charity Navigator is also on that one. It is a website where you can type in the name of the charity, and if it's real, it will come up and talk about the charity. Um, often, if you're not sure if it's real, you can also just Google what they say they're from and put in scam, and stuff will pop up and say, yeah, it's a scam. Um, so just be cautious. Like, if you do want to donate, I would ask them to mail you information and where you can send a check or things like that so you're not giving the money over the phone. Thoughts? Looks like a yes. question. Uh, no question. I just wanted to say I looked on Charity Navigator for Ashley Phillips. Oh, good. 
not as good as this camp. She did her homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think we'll just probably dive a little bit more into, oh, we've already mentioned the text messages, but the text messages are a scam, and they're trying to get you to give up personal information, like your address, um, or any other maybe banking information if they can get you to that point. Uh, your Netflix account is not frozen. Your Amazon package knows where it needs to be delivered. Don't respond to any of those texts. And depending on the phone you have, you can, some, uh, like on an iPhone, you can swipe it, you can delete, or you can delete and report. And so that's always an option to do that. I, I don't work in the back end of IT things, so I don't know what happens once you delete and report, but I'd like to believe that something happens. So when you, when you uh, report uh, messages as, as spam, they actually go into um, a, uh, an engine or a database in the back that evaluates the uh, authenticity of, of messages that are coming from that number. And as, as, a, as a number loses credibility, they increasingly notify recipients of messages from that number that this is probably spam. So you, you're actually engaging and helping the community at large uh, shut these things down. Now, some, some financial institutions, such as Patelco, uh, we now have a, a service that we engage that when somebody gets a text message claiming to be from Patelco, if we can get that screenshot, we can send it to a, uh, basically a reputation uh, protection service, and they'll get that number taken down. They'll actually call the mobile provider and, and get that number taken down so that we can, we can really, really get ahead of, of these people. That is very good to know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go grandparents and then romance. So raise your hand if you've heard of the grandparent scam. It should be everyone. everyone. Okay. Uh, I know I did talk about this last year, but I'm going to just talk about it again because it's so important. Um, it's been around for a long time. The basic premise is you're going to get a call. It's probably not a great connection, or there's some excuse as to why the person cannot be very clear. And there's something urgent. They've had an accident, or they're in jail, or something very serious that is going to make you go, uh oh, I have to help, right? Especially if they're claiming to be your grandparent. Although I've talked to people who said, you know, oh, they claim to be my niece, or whatever. So someone you care about that you would want to help in an emergency. And they're going to try and trigger your right emergency reaction brain and not your logical, that doesn't make sense brain. And so my nephew, his grandma from the other side of the family, so technically not my relative, but I know her very well, uh, was a victim of the grandparent scam late last May, I think. Uh, they called her and said, oh, you know, hi. Hi, Grandma, I had an accident, uh, I hit a pregnant lady, she had to go to the hospital. I've heard a few versions of it, sometimes she doesn't make it, sometimes the baby doesn't make it, but I don't remember exactly which one they told her. Um, and because they caught her in a vulnerable moment, she wanted to help and she reacted. And she actually became a victim of the scam and lost a lot of money. There was a lot going on family-wise that they weren't really talking at the time, so when she heard it, it was, this is a way for me to swoop in and help and rebuild our relationship, because he'll talk to me if I help him with this. Um, I won't get into family drama, but there were valid reasons for not talking at the time, okay? But the, the reaction was, I love him and I want to help. So she went to the bank and took out thousands of dollars. And a lot of tellers are very well trained now to not like, notice when things are not a regular pattern for a customer, especially customers who come in regularly and do their banking, which tends to be older adults, because a lot of younger people do online banking. Um, not that like anyone is defined by their age and how they bank, but you know, trends, okay. So she went in, but because she has patterns of going in and taking out large sums of money to pay bail for someone, um, it wasn't such a red flag, right? And so they didn't stop her from doing it. So here's what has changed and what I want to make sure people know about. They used to ask you to wire money. And then a lot of people got hit to the fact that wiring was probably a scam and that that's not going to work. And they'd start shutting it down and telling the person who's coming in, like, oh, it's a really well-known scam. Don't wire money. So now the, the scammers are asking for cash. And they're asking for it in some creative ways. So she was told, put money in an envelope, or in a few envelopes, because it's 
lot of money, um, write his name and this case number on it, and the courier is going to come to the house and pick it up. So she handed thousands of dollars over to someone that came to her house and took her money from her. Now that person is probably not the scammer. That's someone who's gotten roped in to picking it up. And then we'll talk a bit more about that in the next part. But uh, great, they did a great job. They got her money from her. So you know what they did? They called her back and asked for more. And she gave them more. And it was the third time that they were asking her to send money somewhere now, because it was they asked her to send money out of state. And she went, hmm, why is this attorney who's helping my nephew here in San Jose needing me to send money out of state? So I'm sure you have some thoughts on all these things too at the banking end. Oh, I sure do. Actually, I mean, on the banking end, when you're wiring or you're handing out cash, it's the same. As soon as that leaves your account or leaves your hands, it's gone. It's almost impossible to get that money back. If you do it, and or you know someone who, who made that mistake, the sooner we know about it at the financial institution, the sooner uh, we can look into it, and we have much better chances of perhaps getting some or all of that money back. Uh, it's very low odds. Yes? I have a very dear friend who got a call from her son, supposedly her son, an adult, that he was he was in a severe accident, his nose was broken, and that explains why his voice was mm -hmm. That's all. And it's all his fault, and he'd been arrested, and there was a case number, and one thing and another, and she's like ready to take out the mm -hmm. credit card, so anyway. But her granddaughter, the daughter of his son, walked into the room where she was and said, my father's at his desk in his office. Because the iPhone has something on it where you can see where family members are. Yeah, if you I share it. It doesn't want to track all the family yeah. members. But you could track the people closest to you. Yeah. And then you would be safe for that. She yeah. was saved by this granddaughter who's just a high schooler. Yeah, very good. Uh, I used to work with someone who got a the grandparents scam called but it was claiming to be her nephew. And she was, she was saying that she was ready to send money. And something told her, I'm just going to call my sister, right, the parent of the person that claimed to call. And the thing is, with a lot of the scam stuff, they're going to tell you, especially if it's the jail, like, oh, I don't want people to know, or I don't want my parents to know, please don't call them and tell them. And so if that's to, you know, to prevent that and shut that down. But she's like, no. And she called her sister, and she's like, he's asleep upstairs, right? So she also thankfully took a pause and didn't become a victim of it. And that's the hard part, because the scammers are so good at pushing those emergency buttons in us that we don't take that pause all the time. And that's how, uh, unfortunately, my nephew's grandma ended up losing about $26,000. Wow. Yeah. So take a beat. Be careful. If someone's calling you and giving you excuses and this and that, you know what I'll tell you is if they're in the hospital or they're in jail, there's a way to call back. If someone's legitimately in a, like in a, either of those situations, you should be able to say, I need the number where I can reach you, I'm going to go get some information. And if they're saying, oh, you can't reach us, you can't call us, then that's another big sign that this is a scam. Because someone could be in jail. Yes, um, I'm embarrassed to say I was, was a victim. Um, you said you should tell the bank as soon as you can if you've been made to take money out of your account. Yes. And that happened to me, and I went to the police in my town to see if that could do anything. And basically, because I had done it in my account, I mean, the guy, the policeman was really nice, but it was my fault at that point that I had done what the scammer said to do and gone to my bank and withdrawn the money. So, when you say let your bank know as soon as possible, how would how could I have done it in that case? The teller gave me the money, so. Right. Ah, so I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed that I just. But you shouldn't be embarrassed because it happened. <laughs> yeah. I got two replacement credit cards today. Because they had to shut down. Well, because of, I mean it's endless. Yeah. yeah. Endless. So so be, before before I address the the money. Uh, I would like to address the, the feeling of embarrassment or shame that we get uh, when, when we've done something and, and it was not to our benefit and, and we do feel foolish afterward. This is my job. I do this all the time and I've been scammed. Okay, so if I'm doing this all the time and I get scammed, you, none of you, 
should feel badly for having gotten scammed because these guys, this is how they put money in their bank accounts, this is how they put food on their tables, and this is how they buy everything that they do in their life. They are professionals at scamming people. And, and we are not professionals at, I am, but you, you are all not, not professionals at uh, resisting uh, these folks. I think you had a question. No, I, I just wanted to make a comment about uh, when I, I got a phone call, and it was, it was my grandson, supposedly, and, and he calls me Granny, so that kind of triggered me. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, Granny, I need your help. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, you don't sound like yourself. And he, he said, that's because I broke my nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's just... Yeah, it's really hard. And I know uh, we had talked a little bit about AI stuff and yeah. maybe getting into that. Do you want to talk about it now? Yeah, I was going to jump into that as well. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to go back to, to the cash. Cash is really hard. There's, there's really no way to get that back. But when there's wires or, or transfers, mm -hmm. that can oftentimes uh, be, be brought back. Um, getting on to the, the AI um, and machine. So we have AI, artificial intelligence, we have machine learning, so we, we call it AI ML because they, they kind of fall in together. It's really powerful stuff. And one of the things that has been uh, coming out of that are deep fakes. Now, I'm, I'm sure most of us have heard the term, but has anybody not? Because I can explain it. A deep fake. Okay. Okay. Does everybody remember the movie Forrest Gump? Yeah. Does anybody believe that Tom Hanks uh, spoke with the president? <laughs> so long ago, it cost millions of dollars to, to animate Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump, into these situations where he's meeting presidents and hanging out with, with famous people in film from, from back in those times. A year ago, it still cost a couple hundred dollars. To, to set something up like that because it, it took a lot of a lot of work. With artificial intelligence, there are free services that will edit photos or create small uh, small videos, and for not too much money, I believe it was five dollars in the most recent example. You can take thirty seconds of somebody's voice and turn it into a conversational bit on the phone. Like you, it just comes out of the speaker over there. Um, and it's, it's, it's remarkable how well it works. So when we tie that back to the younger generation being online and posting silly videos and, and doing kid stuff, there's definitely 30 seconds of, of sound bites out there that they can use to create, hey Grammy, I broke my nose type, type sounds. And recently, there was a bank in Hong Kong that fell victim to it in a video chat. So this poor guy who does all the, does accounting of some sort for them gets onto a video call and it's it's all of his leadership in you know, on on the screen. This this is a Zoom and it's got their their videos running and they're telling him yes we need to wire this twenty five million dollars to to this account over there and he sent it. Twenty-five million. Sometimes it's hard to be a good guy, <laughs> but it's it's increasingly uh, common that, that they're they're uh, synthesizing voices or video to to take our money. So one of the things I've been encouraging people to do is establish something with that person, either a, a password. I mean, I remember when I was little, my parents always said, you need to say roller, that they need to say roller skate if they come to you and they say that, you know, your, your mom's been hurt, we might have to take you over to the, the care area. Well, everybody needs to establish that roller skate password with, with your family so that, if you get a call and they say, hey, I've been hurt, you're like, great. Well, not great, but what is, what is the password? And if, if they don't, if they don't give you the password, I mean, you're going to be very suspicious, and you're going to be unlikely to send money without considering what's going on. Yes? So say the password thing, um, you had to have a forethought to create one. 
Yeah. But you can also ask ask questions about something that somebody would know. What's the name of the dog you had as a kid? Or exactly. Yeah. My but, my grandpa has gotten the call claim that claiming it was my cousin, right? Oh, grandpa and whatever. And uh, they were like, oh, I was on vacation in Florida, and he goes, oh yeah, I was watching the cats. <laughs> so, yeah, it was he asked something personal that would ex you know have to have her explain more. Yeah, if you, if you can trip them up with a with a question that only they can answer, you know that's that's perfect. Um, but don't use the uh, the questions that your banker asks you to uh, to do something. You know, your mother's maiden name is 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 not going to cut it here. What was the dog when you grew up? That's a good one. Um, you know, or who was watching the cats? Yeah. Um, that, that type of thing is, is excellent, but we, we have to... Jen, Jennifer's used the, the emergency buttons in, in our head. Um, and we, we, need, we need to we need to take a step back because it, it drives us to make rash decisions. And what we need to do is, is consider these things critically, which means we have to take a breath, pause for a minute, and then decide what to do, don't we have to? Okay. What is that terminology? Deep? Deep. Fake. Fake. Fake? Fake. fake. Not deep dive, but deep fake. Yes. It, is a, it is a deep fake, yes. And it, and it goes, and it's just talking about the, how realistic it is. It's, it's a very deep uh, presence, or it's a, it's a deep imitation of somebody. I saw him over here. Yeah. What was the scam that you fell for? <laughs> 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 so I actually fell for the too good to be true advertisement. Uh, for a, a weight set. I wanted to get some weights uh, at Christmas time a couple years ago. And I thought, all right, I'll order it. And it was, it was way too cheap for, for what was being sent. And I thought, okay, maybe it's a Chinese knockoff. No. They, they sent me a little plastic dumbbell. <laughs> oh, that's me. <laughs> that, that could double as a canteen. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, come on. Now, fortunately, I was able to, you know, say that. It was fraudulent. Give my money back through PayPal, but uh, you know, it happens. Yes. Uh, speaking of PayPal, I just this last week got one that I hadn't seen before. It was it, it was an email, mm -hmm. and supposedly it was from some individual, and it said thank you for your order, mm -hmm. and included what looked like a valid screenshot of a PayPal transaction. Yep and was for $499 or something. <laughs> and it said, you have 24 hours to cancel or alter or change the order. Call this phone number. Yeah. Now, the, the two times previous, I would have fallen for it. <laughs> this time, I did not, and I called PayPal instead. And they said, of course, this is a scam. And they were grateful that I called them because I told them about it. And then, of course, the but that business where they arouse your, your fears, your, I didn't charge $499, or I didn't do this, and then immediately give you a phone number to call, it's so easy, it's so tempting. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'll call the number, you know, and then you're off to the races. They, they got you. Yeah, their goal is to keep you from thinking. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And the previous one that I fell for was at Apple. You know, we've, dis we've discovered malware on your Apple devices. Right. Call Apple, it supposedly came from Apple's support, and call this number. And I, just today, I called Apple just to make sure. I said, you don't ever do that, do you? And they said, of course not. First of all, how do we know you had malware on yeah. your Apple devices? And no, we would never do that, you know. So the, the main message is whatever communication method they Propose, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Call the company directly. Yes, if you have a question about it. Don't don't click that link. No, don't don't, don't tap it. don't tap on that link and, and don't call that number. Mm -hmm. So Judith did the right thing. She actually called PayPal. Yeah. So instead well, of this instead is the third of, time, so now I'm kind of She's like, <laughs> <laughs> it took twice before before I went. Okay. Yes. I think you know one of the reasons I came. To, the main reason I came today. I have four precious little grandchildren, and when I heard about that AI trick, mm -hmm. I'm like, I know, you know, any one of these things, I talk, I have a son-in-law who I play with who does cybersecurity, so I've heard it all, <laughs> but what I haven't heard is one of those grandchildren's voice in the background, there's someone 
so sad and angry because what it does is it destroys our ability to trust. Yes. And if you can't trust, you can't have a decent society. You know, we can't Absolutely. trust that pictures are real, we can't trust that voices are real, we can't trust other people not to cheat us. Mm -hmm. This is this is tragic. It it really is. It's it's it, it, it's not it's not voting well for, for society when, when we can't trust each other. Dehumanizing. Very good. Very good. Removing our human, becoming the doggy on the leash. What we can't trust is is in person, mm -hmm. and another thing that we can trust is the the the, the, the your friends and your family. When these things come up, they are not going to be reacting. They will be listening to what you tell them. And it's likely that, that one of your friends will say, how, how do they know that you have malware on, on your phone? Mm -hmm. Don't call them, call Apple. You know, and, or, or sometimes just the act of explaining it causes us to engage that, that thinking part of the brain instead of all the emergency buttons being, being just mashed down. And, and then we we're thinking, I can't believe these are the words coming out of my mouth. Like, <laughs> why are you not laughing at me? This is silliness. But then, then, then we, we, we make fewer mistakes. So one of the things that we can plan in response to your question is, okay, if I get a call like this, my first reaction is going to be, I'm going to call my son. And I'm going to explain it to him. I'm going to say, no, the kids are right here. Or, you know, Maybe, maybe you don't want to send thirty thousand dollars off to an anonymous, uh, you know, lawyer in in Tennessee or something. That, that by explaining it and having that conversation with other people, we, we put ourselves in a better frame to make wise choices. Yes. Well, I'm not embarrassed, just angry. I had my credit card taken when I was having surgery in the hospital. And when we reported it, they sent another credit card. And then I got a fraud alert from Bank of America because it was a marble, a mobile charge that I hadn't had before. Right. And I didn't realize until I started researching this how easy it is for somebody to just put your credit card number in their Apple Pay, they didn't even need to try credit card. And we believed that it was my caregiver, and the thing that triggered it was that one of the marble mobile charges was right down the street at the corner store. <laughs> and then so, and then the bank said. Don't worry, we are going to cover these charges while we investigate. So my question is, Sean, what does that mean? Does that mean they will absorb any fraudulent charges or just for a small amount of time? So what, what you're, the, the space that you're in right now is, is during the investigation. And what they have done is, is they have made you whole while they perform their investigation. That way you're, you're not sitting there wondering what happened to, you know, how am I going to eat when I, I had $5,000 taken from my account? I know it wasn't that much, but it's, it's, a, it's something that we do to take care of, of our, at, at Patelco, our members. Uh, for Bank of America, it's their customers. They're, they're taking care of you. They're giving you that money for, for a little bit. When the investigation is over, they're going to have a determination. If they determine that these were fraudulent charges, then that you keep the money. You, you are made whole out of that because it is the bank's responsibility to ensure that all charges made on your account were made by you. So. Now, further question. Yes. Um, does that investigation, to be complete, need to have a police report? I don't believe so. Uh, it, it does depend on the circumstances. Um, you know, sometimes we 
we discover that uh, you know somebody's child has uh, run off with the credit card and, and you know bought a bunch of things that uh, were not approved. Um, but because we know it was the child, we do need a police report because we need to be able to prosecute on that. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people are, are not willing to, to criminally charge their kids for, for fraud. Right. Um, but it really does depend on the circumstances of, of the fraud and, and what they need for their investigation. Well, I did not want to go to the police because this person was my caregiver. And we had a very intimate relationship, as people, older people here know. Yeah. You know, this person is dressing you, is bathing you, and all this stuff. What my boss, daughter, in her wisdom, said, you know, this person can be a wonderful, loving person, but she can also be a thief. Exactly. You know what? A thief. 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 So I refused to go to the police. And I took the coward's way out and just told the agency, which was her mother, was the head of it, we don't need you anymore. Our circumstances have changed. And people have said to me, friends of mine, you really did the wrong thing because now this person, if she is guilty, is going to do it to someone else. So, I, I believe that people do what is best for themselves at the time that they did it. And I believe that you did what was best for you at that time. And opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one. <laughs> and we don't always want to see them. But, if, if your friends are treating you unkindly about how you handle the situation, that is a place where you can say, you know, I, just, I didn't have the heart to do it. Right. And, and, I, and I would not describe you as a coward, and I would not describe myself as a coward for, for behaving that way in a certain situation, because we all have to do what's best for ourselves. Right. So, thank you for sharing that, and, and I, I think you're kind of brave for doing it. Uh, but I, I, want, I want you to treat yourself more kindly, too. Right, and we decided we didn't need any more trauma drama, and this was the way we were doing it. Sounds like it worked for you. And it sounds like you also talked that out with your daughter in making that decision, so you know that you really thought through it in the way that you made it, and it wasn't just, oh, yeah. I'm hiding from it. Or whatever. Well, the thing so. is, when the credit card was missing, I had a stroke, and yeah. I can never find anything. Right. So it took a while to even believe that it was really gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's the piece with older people, even if they had it. Yeah, you know, and our minds are not as clear as they used to be. It's not just older people. I have three <laughs> pair of these readers. I have three pair of these readers because I could never find a darn thing. So. <laughs> My wife made me get her air tags for Christmas so she could put them on everything. <laughs> so now she can check on her phone and find her stuff. Um, I also just wanted to say it's a completely different presentation that we offer at Legal Assistance for Seniors, but we do do one that's all about elder abuse. And what you're describing, if it's a known person, is elder financial abuse and it is really hard because a lot of times if it's someone that's known right a child an adult child or niece nephew whatever you know people don't want to necessarily put a relative through the legal system and it it's really hard for them to report that so it's heavily underreported. Um, there are many things you can do like get uh, you can get restraining orders, although that's still putting someone into the system if they violate it, or what, uh, restra sorry, <laughs> restraining orders. You can get them, um, but you can also do things in ways that it doesn't necessarily mean that the person can't see you, but if that person has been the durable power of attorney, you can get them taken off, right, and put someone else so that that person is no longer abusing the finances. So there's a, if anyone has questions about those things, you can always call us. Um, we do have to have the, the older adult themselves call us. Uh, like, I can't call and be like, oh, my brother's living in my mom's basement and I think he's financially abusing her because he like lives off her money and drinks beer all day. He doesn't, but I like to pick on him with that example. So if I call, my work would say, sorry, we have to talk to your mom, right? But if, if an older adult calls and says, hey, I'm having a problem, I'm not, I don't know what my options are. Remember, 
anything between the attorney, it's confidential, they're not going to take it to APS or they're not going to make you get a restraining order or anything like that. So you can always call and ask some questions if you're not sure where to start. I realize this is another, I don't know if you call it a scam, but using a credit card in a gas machine. I did that on my trip um, down to Los Angeles, and fortunately Bank of America caught it and said, did you charge a dollar or something to this credit card? So that's the way the scammers will try and see if you will accept the charge. And so the problem with that is you have to get a new credit card. Hard, and everybody paid automatically out of that one. Mm -hmm. It's a big colossal pain. Mm -hmm. it is, it, and at least they caught it. <laughs> so it's there's there's a variety of ways that that can happen. And and one of those is little devices that they'll put on the uh, the machines the machine. that are out there reading your credit cards. You mean like the ATM? Yeah. So sometimes on ATMs. Yeah. Um, Yes, they're called skimmers. Commonly on and gas station things. They're very yeah. often on, on the gas station, uh, the pumps where you, where you slide the card in and out. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that, that I advise people to do when, when you're out using a, a, you know, a gas station pump, first of all, if, if you have the, the card in your phone, if you can do it with, with that, that's actually the safest way to use your card in that situation. So if, if you can tap to pay with, with your phone, mm -hmm. That's the best. Okay. The second best way is to tap your card. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the cards have little chips in them now that you can just whoop, do it wirelessly. Just hold it up against the little sensor. And that, that is the second best way. If you're like me and you tap to pay, you'll say magic, magic, magic every time. <laughs> <laughs> like, look at this. And I put it on the side and pay and not use the... But that's also a pain. We have, we have a credit card machine right there, and yeah. you know, some some dirt bag is, is stealing your, your information with it. I so the, the the third the third thing is that if you have to slide your your card in there, grab the front of that thing and shake it like it's a, oh, it's oh, a oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like it's a bad child. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, the front of the machine. So what they'll do is is they'll they'll put that little skimmer on top usually, and and they they, they, they do a great job. Again, this is this is their job, and, and they make these things professionally. So it, it's going to look like it belongs there, but when you shake it, it's going to it's going to tap back and forth. It's going to rattle, and you might even pull it off. And if you do, you walk into that gas station, and you say, "What in the world is this?" And I guarantee you, he's not going to say, "Ma'am, you just broke my my gas uh, machine." <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, the skimmer is visible on the outside. So there, there are two kinds. There are ones on the outside, and, and some, some places can still get what's called a deep insert shimmer. Um, it gets very technical, but they, they can be inside, but those are more rare. So it's actually on the outside of the machine. The most common ones are on the outside of the machine, mm -hmm. and, and when, you, when you rattle it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall off most of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's part of the gas pump. You're not going to be able to just shake it off. So yeah, if, if the, the the real the real McCoy uh, card reader on that machine is is going to be on there very solidly. You're not going to be able to harm it. I can't harm it. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so wouldn't it then be better to go into the gas station and hand the service guy the card? I mean, that, they take the card that way too. Yeah, that, that's a that's a much safer way. <clears throat> yeah, and what is it? Five minutes more. Well, it depends on the line and how many people are buying Cheetos. <laughs> But, but still, I mean, my, yes. I drive whatever. I, it's a lot easier than out there at the pump. Oh, for sure. If I mean, if it, every, everybody can handle this their own way. Going in and handing the, the card to right. the like gas station. Is that your it. car? Which you know, number yep. is your car? Yeah. No, I want to fill up on eight, and and if you're good to go, um, you can get get aggressive with the uh, the front of that gas machine. Um, but also, it happens at ATMs. It can happen at, at other points where, where you use your credit card to, to do something. So I encourage people to, to stay in that practice. You know, get, get familiar with, with where you're putting your card. Or if you can avoid putting your card into it, you're, you're better off. I want to touch on romance scams a little bit. Now, we have a question in the back, though. Okay. 
Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say something. I mean, this actually, this uh, um, gas station thing happened to me, and uh, uh, and I actually only discovered it when I looked through my visa statement, you know, uh, at, the, at the end of the month. But what it really taught me was, it is so important. I don't think everybody does that. Really going over your statement every month religiously, you know, because I discovered a few little things. You know, I mean, little things. I mean, this was not. A huge amount. It was eighty dollars, I think. You know, I mean, it's big enough, you know. But um, <laughs> but so, uh, but in general, I think this is really what it taught me: going through my statement, you know, and and, and comparing it with all the receipts I have, etc. I think it's very important. Definitely, and and the gas station is the most common place for that. That's that's okay. almost okay. always where we find it. And I don't. I do look like you also wanted to add something, and I don't want to cut you off. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Oh. Uh, also, when you travel, I got screwed at a Barcelona airport because I got a receipt, but then I got the real price in charge of me, so I thought I paid $100 for this bag, and I paid $395 for oh, 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 oh. And what do you do? You eat it because yeah. I'm not going to go back to Barcelona to the yeah. airport shop. To, mm, yeah, but you do have the receipt. That is something. Uh, they yeah. wouldn't take it. Barcelona. Yeah, no. we'll call you a car. Yeah, yeah but it, it, it was like I discovered it quite a bit. It was a, it was a real problem. So, many years ago, I took a, a young lady to a, a, on a date to a, a nice restaurant down on the coast. And um, we had dinner. And it was it was about a hundred dollars. And when I got back, um, I, I, I looked and, and I, I had signed, but it said that it was like a thousand dollars because somebody had misheated it and and i called my bank i'm like i i did not spend a thousand dollars i'm not getting the second date so we, we, we need to fix this <laughs> and, and actually they said do you have the receipt i said yes and, and it, it was an itemized list of, of everything that we had eaten too i had i had that one and they, they I, I sent them a copy of it and the investigation was over in 15 minutes so when you when you encounter a situation like this, okay. give your financial institution an opportunity to impress you. Okay. <laughs> See when they go right in your bank account and get the cash, it's gone. Right. At least the card you can challenge. Okay. Yeah, especially with credit cards. Right. I and mean, you can challenge those with the bank. Yeah. Uh, I don't want people going. Let's just say enjoy the bag. I did. <laughs> <laughs> is the bag nice? It is. <laughs> oh good. Oh, I love it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I love it close to $400. Yeah. You might not $400 love it, but you know, it's But it really taught me a lesson yes. as oh, far yeah. as, you know, where I buy stuff when I'm traveling. Yeah. For sure. And if you have like eight or nine cards like I do, it's a little hard. I, to I only have like two cards. Uh, one in a backup, and that's it. I don't do a lot of cards anymore. I, I admire simplicity. I think Jennifer wants to move on I, to uh, it's not that romance. I, I mean, we could spend another hour talking about all these things, I'm sure, because the room is full of experience, and unfortunately some of those are negative experiences. Um, but I want to talk about romance scams because there's a lot of pieces to this that are really important. Uh, one is that it's really hard for people who are victims of romance scam to come to terms with it usually because it's not like a quick scam, right? This is someone who usually meets someone online and they start, the, that other person is pretending to be someone and they start building a relationship with them and it'll go on for months before any money is ever asked for. And so the person who is the victim of the scam very often, you know, doesn't want to believe that because they're like, no, I, I've invested in this person and they care about me and they know me. And then all of a sudden that person is like, I really wish I could come visit you, but I just, I don't have the funds, I'm, oh, I want you to come, so I'm going to send you some money, and then you send money, and all of a sudden, oh, I was, I was about to buy my plane ticket to come see you, but my sister had an accident, and she needed me to cover this bill for her, and, and what they want to know is if you're going to send more money, right? Oh, I'm sorry I had to send the money you sent, can you send more money, and I'll come, and guess what, some other emergency will probably happen, um, and it can, it can go really far and it can get very expensive before someone realizes what's going on. So that is one piece of it. And I think we've, we've had a good conversation in here so far today about, you know, it is sometimes natural to feel embarrassed about things, but 
it's not your fault, and it's really better to report and try and, and get as much salt as you can. But there's so many other pieces to what can be happening in a romance scam, including money um, exchanging through multiple people to keep it cleaner for the scammer. So they may have you, uh, they may have the, the person that is the victim of the romance scam receiving money and then transferring money. And that is a money mule. That's someone who's basically washing the money for them because they're scamming someone else, maybe in something completely different. Maybe they're good at lots of scams at the same time. And they've got that person transferring the money from the grandparent scam over to your bank account because there, something was wrong with their bank account. And so they had it transferred to you and then you're gonna send it over to this other account. Um, and that makes it harder, if it is reported, right, it makes it harder for the investigating people to find the scammers because it's going through so many steps. Um, so it's very, you want to be very careful. My thoughts on this are always, it is okay to have relationships or new people in our lives at any age that's healthy and relationships are very good. What you want to be cautious of is anyone who's asking for access to anything banking related or sending money or if it is someone in person, someone who's suddenly trying to get their name on your accounts or move into your house, right? Because it's not always online. People can be romance scammers in person as well. Um, so friends good, relationships fine, banking, moving into the house bad. <laughs> don't let them. Um, and I don't always talk about this, but it popped into my head today as we've been talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, have any of you heard the word sextortion? Sextortion, that's a good one. Yes. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of times it does target young people uh, because they've gotten them to send some sort of racy photo, whatever, and all of a sudden they're being told, oh, we're going to tell your whole family if you don't send money or do this or that. Well, guess what? That can happen to someone at any age. So I'm now going to start thinking about talking about that more during the romance scam because if you have engaged in any kind of activity that's perfectly fine because you're an adult. Um, you don't want someone all of a sudden reaching out to you and saying, oh, because with this AI stuff in the videos, they can take those photos and they can put them into things that are going to be very embarrassing that may not be the thing that you actually did or sent. And then all of a sudden they're saying, if you don't send us this money, we're going to put this video out to everyone in your email. So you just want to be very careful about anything you send electronically. Hey, I can put Sorry. my face on a swimsuit uh, or a Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 Is there anything wrong with that? Okay. <laughs> well, I would say. I really don't look good in the beginning. <laughs> I would say the concern is the deep fake videos that we're talking about because if they're putting your face on someone else's body from a video that was not you, that, that yeah. could be very embarrassing even if it wasn't you. So just be careful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think I was almost scammed by the IRS auditor. Ooh. It was uh, about a number of years ago. I go in with my, I get an audit. I go in with my wheelie with all my records and I'm, and I'm wearing a skirt so that, you know, and I want to look appropriate. And down there, I keep seeing this man looking out the cubicle and it's like, who's he looking at, you know? Mm -hmm. He turned out to be my auditor. So I go down and the cubicle has no door. Right. And there's a desk, so he's sitting behind the desk, and behind him is a bookcase. Well, way back in that early 80s, so long time ago, I got trained as a tax preparer at uh, HR Block, oh. only for my finances, okay? And every time there was a tricky question, the teacher would say, let's look in Pub 15, let's look in Pub 15. And so I get there, and the auditor is very nice, and he says, tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, I do two things, real estate, and authoring, okay? Schedule A, B, C, D, and E. He goes, I, and he said, I go out, well, I author books and get royalties and I get rents. And I put them on Schedule E. And he says, well, we. I think, who the hell is we? So we <laughs> prefer that you put your royalties on Schedule C. Well, if I sold 200,000 books, maybe, but there's no money in selling books. It's in the whatever. Yeah. So I, I had this kind of line where I forget things, but when I need to, they come racing back. And I look at him, and what do I see behind his left shoulder but Pub 15? <laughs> so instead of being a bitch, and going, I go, Mr. Auditor, let's look in Pub 15. Ace the audit. That's what it's like 12 minutes long. I didn't pay a penny. I was released. 
And so, you, you know, because on that other schedule, you put the money in the business, and if there's a positive, then there's another tax. Right. Well, but on E, you can have negatives. That's why in real estate is deductions, deductions, deductions. And anyway, I think the guy was trying to scam me. But especially IRS agents, they, you know, they, they, I'm, I'm sure that they have a performance metric on, on how much they found. And I think some of them do get a little aggressive. And nobody's going to sit there and do my taxes to see if he charged me too much. Right. And you, you did exactly what, what Jennifer has been talking about, where you just kind of started having those emergency buttons right. pushed in your head. And looking and very you, sweet when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> I know what um, it takes to not it. But, but you, you, you did, you engaged back to, to just thinking about it, and then you saw the 15. It, it just popped out. I mean, of course, yeah. it was right behind his left shoulder. <laughs> and, I mean, he was yeah. a dollar after all. So. So I am going to advance a couple of slides. Um, we, we gave ourselves 90 minutes, right? We have until 3.30? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. I was like, this never goes in 60. It's always longer. <laughs> so, okay, good. Um, did I leave it too long? Is it mad at me? Um, just a couple things on these. Caregivers are very important, and I'm not discouraging anyone from getting support when they need it. But when you're hiring someone, always make sure you're doing either a background check or getting references. If you hire through an agency, they should have already done this. If you're hiring privately, make sure you do this. I work for a legal agency, and I would never tell you to do something that was against the law. And I'm going to acknowledge that sometimes people hire caregivers who are not documented to work in the United States. So, if you go to do that and do a background check, you're probably not going to find very much. So I would make sure you at least get references so that you can verify that this person is who they say they are, and if they claim to have done the scope of work before, you want to talk to, if, you know, if that person's no longer around, just talk to a family member who says, yeah, they, they provided those services. Um, so always make sure you're doing that. Um, and then if you have things that you consider valuable, I recommend taking a picture of them. In case you ever do have to file a police report, it will be helpful if you can say, this is the missing item, this is what it looks like. Um, and if you, you know, you're building that trust relationship with the caregiver, and you want to tuck those things away somewhere safe, like a safe deposit box, or a room that locks, or something that keeps them out of anything, you'd be sad if it walked out of your house. Go ahead and put those things aside. Um, and it's also good to have people drop in as you're building a new relationship with the caregiver because it does show that you have other people who know you, know your schedule, check on you. The reason for that is because isolation is a big risk factor for elder abuse. So if that person does have bad intentions of being able to take advantage of your finances or all these other things that can happen as forms of elder abuse, um, it's less likely to happen if they don't believe that you're isolated, if they know that people check on you. So, but what if you are isolated? That's hard. So if, I was just about to say, if you can't physically get over to see people, try and have someone that call. I don't know somebody that is <laughs> Well, that's your caregiver, sort of, but no. But, uh, if, you know, even if it's just, oh, we, we chat, you know, every Tuesday at this time, or if you chat more, great. But if, you, if they know that you have people who check on you to whatever extent that's possible. That is better and safer. So I would say that is a good strategy. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of these. Don't disclose any personal information if you did not initiate the phone call. Now, if I call Patelco because I need to check on something with my account, they're going to ask me for personal information because they want to verify that I'm me. And that's fine. I called them based on the number either on my card or on my statement. And I said, hey, I need to know this thing about my account. Well, I'm glad that they want to know I'm me and not some stranger calling to ask questions about my account. Um, but if that person claims to be calling you from the bank, they should know your account number. And there's no reason they should be asking you to verify it. Exactly. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder on that one. Um, if you are not sure if it's a real thing or not, Again, ask for information. What's the name of the company and your name and what number can I call you back at? Because if it's real, number one, all of those things will be answers that they can give you. But if you still are like, I don't know if I called this person, do I want to talk to them? 
Um, that's when you bounce it off the friend. And again, our brains are magical, and somehow once it's like processed and coming back out of our mouth, we start to hear when things sound fishy. So that is a good tip. And also, if if Patelco calls you and and starts asking questions, you say, "Hold on." You do exactly what Jennifer said, but then you also look at Patelco.org, our website, and check the number there, yeah. because. Our, our member communication center will always tell you, yeah, call back in our, on our 800 number. You'll go to our website, you'll see that same 800 number. You'll find it on the back of your credit card. It's going to be everywhere. But if you get, you know, oh, hey, call, call 925-555-1212, that will be nowhere on that, on that website. Yes? A friend of mine, she, she Can you moved. speak louder? Oh. A friend of mine moved. And she had to set up her Xfinity. Yeah. And so she looked on the internet, found the number, called, but it was not mm -hmm. So And yeah. she got sucked into it. Mm -hmm. So other than having a piece of paper or a bill from Xfinity or on the back of the car or whatever, what do you recommend as far as verifying? Okay, so the, just to repeat so that everybody, everybody gets it, um, she was calling a, a service provider setting up a you know, new um, uh, Wi-Fi at her house, and uh, she searched online, but was given a bogus number. Now these bogus number, numbers are usually posted as ads, and it, it'll say next to it, ad, on, on Google or Bing or, or whatever you happen to be using for your search engine. Don't click the ads. Bad guys can buy ads. What you do is you scroll down past the ads, and then you find the real website. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to fight this because bad guys have taken out. Contact us at the bottom or something? Sorry? Contact us at the bottom? No, uh, in, in a Google search. Oh, okay. So, so the, the person in question actually searched for Xfinity through Google, but I believe she clicked on one of the ads, and it was, it was a bogus ad. ad. And yeah, it was first two always, sometimes five, are, are ads, and they can be bogus. So you just scroll down past that to where the real website and the real search results are and click through there if you don't know the company's uh, website address already. Now, in the case of service providers that you already use, make bookmarks in your browser for them. Because that way you know that you're going to the telco because you put that bookmark there and it was good at the time you put it there. What I usually do is if I've talked to somebody in the company, yeah. I will always write down Just go there and you can learn how to do it too. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the other thing. And, um, 
my, uh, my mother-in-law likes to uh, tell them, I know you're a scammer, and she engages with them. <laughs> well, that's fine. That just takes them on. It, it just takes them on. Like, the, these guys, they, they have time to spend. They, they have money coming from other people, but if, if you're going to provide them some entertainment, they're going to they're take advantage of offshore. Oh, so almost always. Yeah. Almost always. And we'll go to the next slide. Uh, if anyone is making you promises or guarantees, it needs to be in writing. If you ever watch Judge Judy, she tells you, if you didn't get it written down, it doesn't count. So don't let anyone rush you into anything either. If you need time to be able to read it and make sure that it's written in properly and there's no weird little catch, right, about you actually getting what you are being told you're gonna get. Um, and I know we mentioned it already, but don't buy things from people that knock on the door. But if you do, uh, you are protected if you sign a contract with someone who came to your door. You have three days to cancel it in writing. If you are over the age of 65, they put a new rule in back in 2021 that extended it to a total of five business days. So if someone did come to the door and you signed some sort of contract with them, you can cancel well, it. You can cancel it. On the line, you can cancel it. Some guy at the door, hello? Well, so if you sign a contract, they should be giving you paperwork, right? Should be. Right, so, because otherwise, what did you sign? Right, but so if you, if you do, like, because there are people who sell stuff door to door, right? Not as much anymore, but there are still people. If you okay. sign something and you're like, why did I buy this five thousand dollar vacuum? Okay, you should have paperwork, and you can, as long as you cancel it, you have to. I always send a certified letter, so you have proof that you did it in writing and within the timeline. They have to cancel the contract. Well, I mean, assuming that's a real address, the real name is so subscribing. Yeah, there may be nobody to send it to. Yeah. So, so, so typically, when there's a contract involved that is a legitimate company. Um, they're going to leave you a copy of the contract, and you should be able to cancel it with them. And, and if they're not willing to cancel it, you have that contract, you have your efforts documented of trying to cancel the contract, and you'll be able to take them to court. That's that's what we're looking out for here. Not so much people uh, scamming door to door, but where you actually you you, you got buyer's regret. It was high pressure. It sounded really good at the time, and then they left, and you went, "What did they do?" That, that five thousand uh, dollar. Uh, vacuum was going to do my dishes too. <laughs> <laughs> I was a police trainer for three years. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm talking about legitimate contracts with this. You are legally protected for. You have up to five days if you are over 65. Um, and then we mentioned a lot of the red flags. But if you're being pressured, it's limited time. You need to do it right now. Or if you're, you can't bring a friend or family member. It's a really good secret. The lawyers don't want you to know about it. Come sign this. Um, if they're asking you to pay up front for anything. If you won something, there should be no reason that you're paying up front. You shouldn't be paying lottery taxes to get your lottery winnings released. That's a common one. And if they're asking you to pay in gift cards, we already said, right? That's a walk away, hang up the phone, whatever it is, don't go buy gift cards and give the information to anyone. That's what it was like on a gift card. Mm, yeah. yeah. Anything to... Oh no, I actually you, you covered that very well. Okay. Don't be afraid or embarrassed about if you need to stop and ask questions. And the golden rule of all things here, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I don't know anything about that. Yes. Yes. Sean, I have a question about the sound Okay. Is this something that we sign up for before we need it? How do we get involved with your organization? So Patelco is a community-based um, credit union. So you can come to any of our branches. Uh, we do have a Berkeley branch. And, and become a member of Patelco. And we can become your banking institution. It's, it's a bank. It's right. a bank. So, so we're so moving the accounts to their... If, if, you want, if you want to move your accounts there, you can. If you want to simply open up new accounts because you, you want to have more than one institution in your life, you can do that. Uh, we, we would love to be your institution of choice for all of your banking needs, and, and we will do our darndest uh, to take care of you as a member. As a representative of legal assistance for seniors, I am not endorsing any banking things, but <laughs> I will say that uh, when my daughter will be eight next month, and when we decided to open a savings account for her, we did go to Telco to do it um, because I liked the idea of her having a credit union instead of like Bank of America or Wells Fargo. So 
right? So two of the right things. But when, when, when we look when we look at uh, banks and credit unions, uh, banks are for profit. They exist to create value for their shareholders. Right. A credit union exists as a cooperative. It is not for profit, and it exists to serve the members. We don't have any customers. We have members, and and one of my job, part of my job, is taking care of the members. Now, my, my part of that is is helping the fraud team and protecting the information, keeping keeping it all where it's supposed to be. The secrets stay, stay secret. Um, and and the, the rest of my job, I get to come out and do these things. <laughs> and and, and I, I love this. I thought I was going to be terrified of presenting, but I've enjoyed so many of these presentations. That, that this is one of the things that we do as, as a, a benefit to the community. That's part of our charter. Spell, spell it. Uh, P-A-T-E-L-C-O. It was originally founded as the Pacific Telephone Company Credit Union. So are the accounts covered by the federal insurance? They're actually covered by the NCUA, which is a peer organization to the FDIC. They have the same limits for protection and and all of the all of the same coverage. They're they're basically clones of each other. They just service different um, types of financial institutions. There's another one for savings and loan as well. I don't remember what it's called. Can you say that again? Instead of the FDIC, it's called what? The NCUA. What does that stand for? It's the I believe it's the National Credit Union Association. Okay. All right. If I had to guess, that's exactly what I would come up with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they come out every year, and they audit us just like the FDIC does uh, to, to banks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're tough. I've had to deal with them. So. What's your official title there? I'm the Senior Principal Information Security Analyst. Well, that's very that's a lot <laughs> There's a lot of syllables, and I'm told that the more syllables that are in there, the better it looks on my resume, but I'm not looking for a new job. I love this place. I grew up in banking. My grandfather was a banker starting at 13 years old, he retired and went back as the controller. In, in Milburn, New Jersey, was, oh I'm, I'm older than anybody here. In Milburn, New Jersey, but the whole bank, the bank, it was always the bank. The bank. <laughs> you know what I mean? The bank. The bank is serious business. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you do find that you are a victim of identity theft or fraud, you can take some steps. Always notify the financial institution where the fraud has taken place. And then they can close those accounts. And I know we've already touched on a lot of this, but this is just how things will go here. So you'll want them to close it, right, so that no one can continue to use the account that's got fraud. You can file a police report. You're not required to in all situations, but it doesn't hurt if you want to file a police report. If you do that online, how do you file a police report? I... Every police I, department is different. Yeah, I was going to say, it might depend on where you live, actually. Um, so I, I don't have a blanket answer to that one, but I I would call the non-emergency line in Hayward, where I live, and I would say, this is what's going on, what do I need to do, and then they would tell me what, what steps to take. Because you, you can always call the non-emergency line. Um, and then keep copies of all documentation. I actually realized I skipped one, and I'm going to go back up to it. So I'm going to say keep copies of everything because sometimes identity theft will go far deeper than that tip of the iceberg you just found. But you, the other tip on here is that you can put a fraud alert or credit freeze. Now I want to say you don't have to be a victim of identity theft to do that. You can do that at any time. So if you are someone who is not out there opening lots of new accounts, right, um, there's no harm in placing a credit freeze. It means no one can use your credit, not even you. So like if today is the day you're a target and you're like, oh, I want that red card. I've never gotten that red card. Now I need 5% off. And you go to apply for that target card and your credit is frozen. They're going to say, sorry, you, we can't check your credit. We can't give you a credit card. So if you do really legitimately want to open an account, you can unfreeze your credit. I think they call it thawing. You can thaw it for a few days um, and then let them run what they need to run to issue you a new account and new card. You can do it, yeah, through the, um, there are three of them. Um, I'm going to go back and forth because they have a slide that says a little. Well, I, oh, I had a slide. Oh, no, this was, yeah, this is the edit. Yeah, this is the edit. Sorry. It's been, it's been pared down. I think it's in the back. There's a handout with it, though. Um, I'll go back to where I was. Uh, there's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. 
And um, so you can place the freeze with all of them. They all basically do the same thing, but sometimes slightly differently in the way that they do it. Someone asked me why there's three, and I had to go look it up one time, so I'm just gonna share that there used to be many more small regional ones, but as things have gotten bigger and more technological over time, it's been consolidated into those three being the main three. So, I don't know if that's interesting, but I thought it was. You could buy a membership, and then there's supposed to be identity that or whatever. There are companies that sell monitoring and all of that. Frankly, I feel like my biggest job is to protect my accounts, and so I don't, I'm don't. i not willing to pay any extra for something that I think my bank should already be doing for me. Um, I don't know how you feel about that statement, but... Uh, I, I figure a, 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 man, a membership to uh, protect my identity is a lot less of a headache than them trying to recover it. Um, You're both right. Yeah. <laughs> no, nobody's wrong here. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has to make the best decision for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but you can go ahead and do this, and it, it can be very helpful because it means no one else is out there doing it uh, and get you know getting things in your name. So I I don't I'm not saying you recommend that you have to go do it, but I, it's not a bad idea. I'm going to put it that way to, to look into freezing your credit. So there's there's two other things that I want to add here. Um, if if you find yourself a victim of identity fraud or identity theft. Contact all of your financial institutions because it, it can go deep and they, they might try to worm their way into your legitimate institutions. The other item that for the, uh, the young people in our lives, you can freeze the credit for minors. I did it for my daughter. So when, by doing that, you prevent minor identity theft because some people will, um, these people who are willing to do identity theft, they'll steal it from anybody. Um, you know, like voting in some states, they'll, they'll steal it from a dead person mm -hmm. to, to do what they, they need to do. That's the easiest theft if they're dead. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there was this pretty little girl on TV last week with blonde hair, and mm -hmm. she went off to school, and they found her 40 miles away, her backpack by a lake, they haven't yeah. found her yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to say that you can get your credit report. And it used to be for free once a year, but when COVID hit, they changed it to weekly, and it's remained that way. So you, if, yeah, if you just want to like always look over your credit report and make sure no one's looking at it, you can get it weekly. That seems a lot to me. But if you were already a victim of some sort of fraud, you might want to be checking it that often to make sure nothing new is coming in. Uh, when you look at a credit report, it should tell you what accounts are open. Any old accounts that you've ever had open should be listed on there and show as closed. It'll make sure that showing that you made payments on all these different things. What am I, am I missing anything? No, it's, it's mostly there. Yeah. So um, there's all, and then you want to look because if there shows that you have an address on there that you've never lived at, you want to contact that credit reporting company and try to clear that up or figure out what's going on. Yes. So, you know, you're really careful. You do everything. And then you get like I did yesterday. Well, a couple weeks ago, a letter from Sutter Health telling me they've been hacked and all my information has been yeah. hacked. Wow. Um, that happened. I've been, my union was hacked, my employer was over the years. Mm -hmm. Credit cards, and I'm always, yep. I'm, I'm very careful. Mm -hmm. And I have experience because somebody gave it to me that checks. What is happening here? What should I be doing? So if, if you signed up for the free, you know, I, I credit monitoring service that is, that is offered as as, as the, the remedy for these these breaches that are constantly happening. Experian will be looking at their records to ensure that there aren't new accounts being opened up under your name, and and if if there is one, they are to notify you. Okay. You'll get an email that said we've we've detected a new account opened under your name, and you're like, well, yeah, I just redid my mortgage, or I just switch my checking account or the telco. Whatever it was, um, you, you'll be able to say, yes, that was that was fine. Or you can say, whoa, holy smokes, we need to, we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. And Experian is in a good position to do that. Okay. They're, they're able to reach out to the creditors and they say, well, hold on, like this, this wasn't right. And then hopefully prevent anything from, from going further. Yes? What if you already have an Experian account from another hack? Uh, do I open a new one? 
for Summit, or do I stick to the one that I got for God knows what? I'm, I'm not sure how they handle that. I don't think they add another two years onto the end, but they might reset your start date so that you have two years from when you sign up. Okay, because as I said, it's like constantly. I mean, so far, knock on wood, everything's been okay considering so many times. So some of us may never have to pay for identity monitoring because it, we'll, we'll just be getting hacked so often at, at these other companies yeah. that we'll have it free for life. I was, life. Records. I oh, was yeah. that was like, whoa, what are you up to? I saw your hand uh, first. I was just going to say, that's when you freeze your credit. The first time you find out you've been hacked. Or, that, or before even then. Or, or even before. before. Yeah. before. But uh, for sure you should do it at that time, because yeah. that means your name is out there on the so-called dark web. <laughs> 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 the time is becoming yeah. acceptable. Sorry? I said time is becoming acceptable. I'm cynical. We have a crime family in the White House okay. with crimes. Okay. So, so, so I, 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 can't, I can't go into politics. Okay. Um, and, but it's but no, no, I, I, would, I would say that, that crime is becoming more uh, prevalent, the, the, the numbers are going up, and and a lot of it is, is due to how interconnected we are now. The internet has given us some amazing things, it has also given us spam and advertisements for disgusting things and and other terribleness, but it has a, done a lot to, to advance the, the knowledge and, and research and, and connectedness of people. Um, so, so now, instead of, you know, Having to reach Jennifer over, uh, you know, a, a letter to, to plan a presentation that we're doing. I was able to do it over email very quickly, and we met soon so that we could put together the, the presentation and figure out what we're doing. So there, there are positives, and, and I think that um, we're all well served to, to also look at the positives because I don't I don't feel good when I'm when I'm that cynical. So okay, it's time for us to start wrapping things up here. Um, I think you can take a couple comments maybe, but I just will also say uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I like to say unless you're living off grid somewhere growing all your own food and like not touching technology, your information is out there. So we can do a lot of things to try and protect ourselves, um, but breaches happen, all these things happen. So if you can take steps like freezing your credit or doing things like that, ahead of time, there are extra ways to protect yourself. Things can still go wrong sometimes, Absolutely. but uh, I like technology more than I like growing my own food. So. Uh, uh, why should I add, um, with my house insurance, I have a policy yeah. that's next to nothing, and they cover up to a million dollars, and they take care of everything, as far as the follow-up. Right. 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 This is what you want. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Which, com which company is that? <laughs> your safe code. Oh, wow. Uh, I've learned now to get income streams out of my rentals with no tenants. So, uh, for the rest of my life, I'm willing to share it with you later. Okay. okay. <laughs> That'll be a presentation. Yeah. So this is back to uh, computer uh, scams. Yeah. The one that you click on a link and then all of a sudden you get flashing. There's a virus in your computer, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought you could address that one. I mean, when I saw that, I just closed out of my computer. Because yeah. I know that they can't get into anything if, the, if it gets closed down. So, so nine times out of ten, just yeah. closing that, closing out yeah. of that or rebooting your computer is, is, is all you need to do. Uh, sometimes the virus does get on there, and that's why I, I encourage everybody yeah. to have virus protection on their computers. Um, but typically, you know, it's, it's just annoying and trying to get you to, to, to react in, instead of, uh, you know, take action. So uh, that's, that's basically what I would do. I would just close it, maybe reboot, come back, and, and be okay. The Geek Squad got into my system and supposedly the Geek Squad and started throwing everything away. Just took over my system. Oh goodness, that's terrible. It was terrible. Thank you. Okay. Last comment. All this conversation has made me recall a fraud trauma that I tried to repress. <laughs> so I want to ask you about it. Several years ago I was living in Florida 
and I got a letter, a snail mail letter from Wells Fargo Bank saying, thank you for opening these two accounts. So I went to the Wells Fargo Bank in the town where I was living and I said, what is this about? I don't have Wells Fargo at all. Right. So I sat down with one of the managers that was versed in fraud, and she did some calling, and then she said, this person has opened up accounts in your name. They have your social security number. Mm -hmm. So you need to go to the police and social security. And I did that. The police didn't care much. Social Security, at this time, they weren't even letting you into the building. You had to talk to them on the phone. Oh, my goodness. And they said, um, do you have a Social Security Internet account? And I said, yes, I do. And they looked it up, and they said, you have it. It's password protected. You should be fine. But I obviously wasn't fine. Yeah. I'm concerned with that that is a pretty smart. number being out there. It all seemed to be finished. But now that I'm hearing you talk about this, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> so so th don't don't be nervous. Ner nervous is also not, not a fun way to live. Right. So Jennifer's saying information is, is probably out there. We, we probably all have a lot of our information out there in these in these, you know databases and, and being shared by, by bad guys. It doesn't, that doesn't mean that we're doomed. We still just need to take wise actions, make good choices when these events come up. And if, if you're concerned, perhaps getting the, the identity monitoring is, is something that would help make you feel better. Know that somebody is out there looking, for, for, looking out for you, that, that this won't be a problem. So to wrap up, I just pushed it to the end slide. I skipped over some Medicare fraud stuff. There's a table on the back table. There's information on Medicare fraud if you want to take any or ask questions. If you do need any help with Medicare, this is the line of the HICAP program. Both of, both of the HICAP program and all of our legal services are at Legal Assistance for Seniors. But this is the number to call if you have any Medicare questions. And then if you have any legal questions, it's the, the other phone number. I'll just jump back real quick. That's our legal. So that's on our cards, pens, brochures, and everything in the back. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.